Yo, what up YouTube? Your Tommy here, and this is Springfield Central Square. <sighs> yes, I don't know if you can see anything through the square, but there's the sign for it. There's homeless artists, <laughs> and there's the fountain that doesn't have any water right now. So, there's that. Uh, that office building is where I did mediation for a while, and it was, that was a fun, and enjoyed that class. Yeah, I'm holding this awkwardly. Question today that I got for you guys is, is God worthy of worship? Now. Investigating this question, we have a few factors to look into. We have to think about what is worship and what is God himself. So, first, we look at worship. And worship, in my opinion, is uh, degrading yourself or humbling yourself to become part of a whole that emphasizes someone else or something else. Um, it's a really vague concept, um, but it's like Wittgenstein instead with uh, rules and wolf fallen, I guess. And when you see worship, you know it. <laughs> so that's that. Um, there's a few things that are my rules with worship. I don't worship something just because it's powerful. Um, I don't worship, like, Michael Phelps because he can swim really well. Or, I don't worship America because it's the most powerful nation in the world, or in world history. Now, looking at that, I also don't worship uh, things that own me that rule over me. So I don't worship the president. If I had a king, I wouldn't worship the king. Um, that's just some of the rules. Um, so now that the rules are set, let's look at God himself. Yes, I'm looking at you, God. There's one thing I know about God, and that's that he can be how I say this without cussing? He can be very, uh... Hmm. Well, let's just say he does a lot of evil things. Ooh, I said it. He does evil things. Please. Save the hate. <laughs> he does evil things. That's biblical. Trust me. God has done so many evil things in my life that... It makes me pretty angry sometimes. Some of those evil things, guys, you can relate. You really like this girl, and she goes out with another guy that you know is not right for her, and that he's a complete loser. And then you're like, Ugh, that's terrible, that's evil. Why would you put a girl through that misery? Why would you put her in that abusive relationship? Evil. Some people come to power that are completely evil themselves. I think we all know that that happens. And who allows it? Who puts God into... Who, put, who puts those people into power? Grievous evil. Yes, he says, God does. God does grievous evil. Most grievous evil. Now, I already made a video about how Satan is the root of all evil and all about that. You can look that up. But God does evil too. So, in a sort of different way. So, looking at that. Why worship God? Why worship someone that does horrible things? It's a legitimate question, right? So... What do you guys think? Should we give him a chance? 
I think the answer lies into the definition I've already given. I know that God is powerful, God created this universe, God uh, might even be extra dimensional, but being extra dimensional, uh, from a different universe, being all powerful, does that entitle him to being worshipped in the way that we do? I don't think so. Because there's many things in this universe, many powers that are very powerful, but we don't worship them. And then we see God is good, but God does evil, so I guess that sort of illegitimizes him for on that basis now, doesn't it? I just have one thing, maybe a few other things. And this is in Ecclesiastes as well. The answer to why we worship the most grievous evil doer. The first thing I'm going to take from Ecclesiastes is that God is good. He is genuinely good. He might do evil things, but they do. he does them to do good things. And it's very difficult to explain, but just know that his plans, if you follow them, they might be rough, they might be harsh, but eventually they do end up doing great things. And that is quite a positive for that. Ah, uh, this square is always busy. So God is good. Most good that I've ever seen in this universe. There's another thing. And that's the inherently worship-deserving nature of God. And this one I'm borrowing from Rudolf Otto, who is a religious theorist. Um, when you experience the world that I have numerous times, when you just take a breather, take this universe in. I'm in the middle of Park Central. Like, most of this, um, probably everything here is man-made. Even here, I can sense God. I can sense that I am lesser than Him. Rudolf Aldo calls God the Mysterium Tremendum. His word, not mine. When you are in the presence of God, Nothing that you can do but feel lowered and feel in awe that you feel the mystery of God. That you know that He's so great that you'll never understand everything about Him. And when you look at nature, as Jesus said, nature itself sings of His glory. I wish I could show you guys how I see this universe. The frequencies, the, the greatness, the vastness of every single piece of it. Uh, and all to the very microsp microscopic level attest to him. This is the greatest piece I have ever seen. Nothing that man creates can ever compare to what God has done. He is worship worthy inherently. You have the feeling it is inbred in us to worship Him naturally. And when we look at the world and the universe, how great it is, and how the world attests to him, you feel the vastness of this universe, and you feel the vastness of God, and you just know that there's a line that everything in this universe goes below when it comes to worship, but God goes beyond that line. 
nothing is like him. He is the one. What is the... God is one. He is alone. Only him. Only he could have done all this. And that's why we worship. Because we are inherently predisposed to. We, and we feel it. And we naturally follow that feeling. Okay. This has been another long video, but I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. That God is wow, awesome, amazing. And this has been the video. I'm going to sign off here. See you guys later. Peace.